May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. With the birth of our son earlier this week, family life was more demanding than usual. Even when I was not involved in some family matter, my mind was still occupied with family matters. And so I found it hard to concentrate on writing a sermon, on thinking creatively and deeply about the text. The only way I could do it was to have an aid in drawing me to the text, and that aid were photographs. And so I delved into the collection of my photographs to bring Psalm 121 alive. I promise the next week you'll have a conventional sermon again, but this week you will have to make do with an illustrated reflection on the readings. I lift my eyes to the hills, or should that rather be mountains? The Hebrew word used is harim, the highest land form in the Hebrew language, most often translated as mountains. And that's how it has been translated in most other languages in this psalm too. It's just the translators into English who have chosen to translate it with the lower land form of hills. Maybe in England, in contrast to Scotland, for example, you could not often lift up your eyes to the mountains. Most people in Judah lived in the high country, where steep valleys cut deeply into the barren ridges. Even from the rolling hills, the ridges of the high country are constantly visible. The Judean mountains reach an altitude of up to 1,200 meters. In the east, this range drops precipitously to the Dead Sea Valley, which has an altitude of about 400 meters below sea level. That's a drop of 1,600 meters, certainly anything beyond what could be experienced in the British Isles and many other places. Nevertheless, the term ha, or mountain in Hebrew, could also be applied to lower elevations, rather than a scientific definition of exact altitude above sea level, the term mountain characterizes the significance of the landform. From the relatively low heaven hills in the south to Mount Tabor in southern Galilee, which stands above the plain of Jezreel, to Mount Hermon in northern Galilee, these are the mountains of Israel. Mount Hermon reaches a height of 2,814 meters above sea level and was covered by snow during much of the year. But with what emotion does the psalmist lift up his eyes to the mountains? For centuries, people have believed that it was in a sense of awe and amazement. But in the last century, the 20th century, commentators have suggested that the mountains are a threat. Mountains are dangerous territory to travelers. Mountains are places where bandits live and fall upon the settled population. Such an explanation may seem logical, but they are, it is probably an, an imposition of our modern mindset onto the ancients, for the Bible never really portrays mountains as a place of threat. Yes, mountains are wild places where wild animals live, they are remote places, but through that they often display the majesty and care of God. Mountains are also often the places where God is experienced, where worship is due to God. To this day, monasteries are often erected on or amid mountains, here where people for millennia have had a profound sense not only of God, but also of their own place in the world. Mountains probably generated more sense of awe than a sense of dread. People experienced mountains in their daily lives.
But there is an argument that the mountains referred to here in the psalm were the mountains of Jerusalem, a place of pilgrimage. After all, the psalm is labelled a song of ascent, which has often been understood as a song associated with pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, in that time did not look so impressive as it looks now, but it was a significant city nevertheless. Some commentators suggest that this psalm was prayed as pilgrims caught their first glimpse of the heights of Jerusalem. Other commentators thought that after the uplifting experience of a service in the temple of Jerusalem, this was the blessing and assurance that pilgrims would take with them into their daily lives. Whatever it was, it is clear that the psalm expresses a profound trust in God, both in daily life and at those special moments of awe and wonder. Or in the common metaphor, the psalm declares that God is with us, both in mountaintop experiences and when we walk through the valleys of life. The psalms not only inform us about ancient piety or universal sense of awe, wonder and sorrow, no, psalms call the people of God to prayer. They lead Jews and Christians to a greater knowledge and experience of God so that their lives are infused with the presence of God and their very being in all situations of life is directed towards God. At times, quite some translation of language and context is required. At other times, the Psalms can lead our prayer more directly. And I think that it is easy to make Psalm 121 our own prayer. So we lift up our eyes to the mountains. If we can, it is something higher than the port hills. We lift our eyes to the mountains. In the presence of the door, we may feel insignificant. We are only a speck of dust in the vastness of the landscape. And so the call comes to our lips. Where does my help come from? In this world, where among humans I am just one in the crowd. Where does my help come from? In the wild places where I sense the wonder and awe of the eternal, where I see a beauty not formed by human hands. In such a world, our lives begin to take on a new perspective and we realize that it is no use to strive to try to control our own little lives. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, that the creator and sustainer of the universe should be concerned about me, me, the insignificant mortal, that is astounding. But when we embrace this assurance, it is comforting. If we bring the witness of our ancestors of the faith, if we bring the words of the Bible and the experience of the world together, then we can learn to trust God in all situations of life. Looking at nature to learn more about our relationship with God is an important part of Christian understanding. Jesus frequently did this. Look at the birds of the air that do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to the his life? Trust, therefore. Trust God also in the voice of daily life. Trust God with your needs and the needs of your family. See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. See how the mountain daisies grow in inhospitable places. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? 
So do not worry, saying, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the non-believers run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So entrust your ways to the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. God is concerned about you wherever you go, and God is with you whether you feel confident or not. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Even at times when God seems distant and uninvolved, God is at work in the world and at work in our lives. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade and your right hand. Know that God is with you every step of the way, that when you feel powerless and overwhelmed, God will protect you and give you strength to carry on. The sun will not harm you by day. Though you feel thirsty and exhausted, though you walk through dry places, God will refresh you, will not let the heat overwhelm you. The moon will not harm you by night, for God will quieten your fears. All that threatens to overtake you and that dispirits you. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. So entrust your life to the Lord. Do not think that you need to control every aspect of your life. For the Lord will guide your life, will guide you in big decisions and small, will watch over the ordinary and the momentous events. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 